Thank you so much for the warm welcome. It is indeed a real pleasure to be here um, and a real privilege to have this opportunity to share um, with all of you um, the work of Dignitas and in particular uh, around our theme today of equipping and supporting resilient school leaders. Um, as you've heard, uh, my name is Deborah. I have the privilege of leading the team at Dignitas. Um, and uh, the additional privilege of having worked in the education and child protection space within East Africa for the last uh, 15 years. Um, I'm joining you today from Nairobi, Kenya, um, which is very much home as well as um, the birthplace of the work um, done by Dignitas. Um, and excited to be able to share with you today. Our theme for today is equipping and supporting resilient school leaders. And um, I thought it would be useful to begin today by putting into context um, the work that we do at Dignitas and, and how that led us to a particular course of action in response to the pandemic last year. Um, Dignitas is an award-winning education development organization. We have been honored to have our work recognized um, with a WISE Award in 2020 and over the last three years by 100 um, on their global collection of uh, education innovations from across the world and most recently by World Bank, particularly in relation uh, to our work uh, around digital training and coaching tools for educators. At the core of who we are at Dignitas is an innovative training and coaching approach that seeks to empower schools and educators, particularly those in marginalized communities, to transform student opportunities. Our vision is a world in which all schools are vibrant places for children to thrive and succeed. A little about our context, as I say, you heard, uh, heard me say that we are uh, joining you from Nairobi, Kenya. And sadly, what we see in our context here is that children are schooling but not learning. Um, these statistics that you see on the screen are actually from before COVID. Um, there are some data sets coming out now that speak to the current situation. But we were in crisis long before the pandemic. In Sub-Saharan Africa, World Bank states that 87% of children are in learning poverty and cannot read a simple text by age 10. Our regional data gathered by the OESO assessment states that only 30% of class three learners can do class two work. So children are not progressing having gained the knowledge and competency that they should year on year. And by the time children get to the end of primary school, which is class seven to eight, um, only 60% of children can actually apply foundational numeracy context. So we have huge gaps in foundational literacy and numeracy, um, and the evidence is there and it speaks quite loudly to that. Of course, COVID has exacerbated many of these gaps, many of these inequalities, and we'll dig into that a little further in the next few minutes. So many children are sadly not leaving school with the competencies they need to be able to thrive and succeed in what is an ever-changing and increasingly complex world. The World Bank declared this learning crisis, the global learning crisis in their development report of 2018. And in that report, they not only declared the global learning crisis to address that crisis, and having looked at evidence from across the globe, they pointed to several things that would actually make a difference for learners. And these three things on the screen uh, particularly resonated with the work of Dignitas. First, effective school leadership focused on learning, improved teacher support and in de uh, development, and improve pedagogy. And these three things are really core to the Dignitas model of how we support school leadership teams to improve learning within their schools. Dignitas is uh, very proudly evidence-based and data-driven. 
And over the years, we've studied quite closely the impact of the support that we've been able to give to school leadership teams. And in particular, we have a team and we were asking the question, what drives the biggest impact for learners? For children who are most marginalized within the schools that we partner with, what is it that we can do in partnership with their school leadership teams that will have the most impact on their learning outcomes? And all of that data has helped us to see that there are three pillars to that support that we give through school partnerships that are actually key to driving impact. And these are first instructional leadership, so a real keen uh, focus on the competencies, the mindsets, the strategies that will improve the quality of teaching and learning. Secondly, school and classroom culture. And under this banner, we ask ourselves three key questions with the schools that we partner. Are learners safe? Are they happy and are they valued? And then third, learner engagement. How do we move away from, at least in our region, the traditional methods of teaching, um, which are focused on rote learning and memorization um, and not particularly learner focused? How do we shift from a teacher-centered approach to a learner-centered approach? And we see these three things as being really key to improving learner competencies that are aligned to Kenya's new curriculum, which is the CBC or competency-based curriculum and focuses on competencies like uh, communication, collaboration, critical thinking, self-efficacy. So we see these three pillars as revealed by the evidence to be those that will really drive impact for children in our schools. And so we partner with school leadership teams because we believe these teams are the key drivers and agents of change within their schools. Now, schools look slightly different across different settings, but typically when we talk about school leadership teams, we're talking about head teachers, about deputies, um, about teacher leaders, which could be those in formal positions of authority or those who are simply natural leaders amongst their peers. And often our school leadership teams engage government officers as well. And um, locally we have curriculum support officers and quality and assurance, quality assurance officers who often engage as part of these school leadership teams. And we partner with these school leadership teams for a year. And in the course of that one year partnership, we work together through a series of learning cycles. And those learning cycles follow the pattern that you see on your screen here. I'm sure the I do, we do, you do framing is familiar to many of you. Um, and, and indeed it is the framing for these learning cycles, but we break that down a little further into the five steps you see along the bottom. The first is content delivery. And in some ways, this is what the smallest part of what we do. It, it takes the least time. So communicating a new concept, perhaps sharing a reading, a video, an animation that helps to highlight that. And then modeling that. And this is where we work very closely with our school partners and our alumni to help demonstrate that new concept, that new strategy, and what it looks like in practice. We move on to have the school leadership teams themselves practice that new strategy, believing that it's this modeling and practice, again, as evidence has shown, particularly in our context, that will drive shifts in classroom practice and shifts in leadership practice. Then we work together with the school leadership teams to set goals um, and we coach to support uh, the achievement of those goals within a school setting. And this is really key to how we believe we can transform classroom practice and leadership practice for improved learner outcomes. All of this takes shape around these six core competencies that over the years we've seen to be the most important in developing model school leaders. Having school leaders that are focused on learners, learner-centered leadership, um, emotionally intelligent leadership, um, leading with a growth mindset. You can see the six here, and these are at the core of all of the training and coaching support that we give to our school leaders. Coaching is really key to our success and key to ensuring that 
new concepts go beyond theory and become practice. Coaching is individualized, it's delivered at a classroom and at a school level, working very closely hand in hand with the school leadership teams. So as you saw in the learning cycle earlier, we help them to set goals. We then observe their practice of these new strategies. So that could be a, a classroom observation. It could be an observation of a school walkthrough or some other leadership practice. But the observation allows us to give effective feedback to the school leaders and the teacher leaders to prompt their reflection and help them set a new set of goals so that the cycle begins again. So coaching is really core to improving leadership and classroom practice. Our coaching is informed by competency rubrics of the six competencies I showed a few slides back. We have a rubric that shows what each of those looks like from beginner to mastery level. And essentially we're trying to, through our school partnerships, move educators from beginner to mastery. And even if they don't achieve mastery in the course of partnerships, setting them on that course towards mastery. These competency rubrics are designed in partnership with government and other stakeholders and are first aligned with national curriculum frameworks. So we ensure we're not asking educators to do anything that contradicts what essentially their employer, the government is asking them to do. We make sure that it's enabling curriculum delivery. Secondly, we make sure that it's there to motivate educators. Coaching has so often in our context been seen as a form of assessing or at worst case, even policing. Um, and it hasn't always come in a supportive uh, context. And so we ensure that the competency rubrics and coaching is designed and delivered in a way that nudges positive shifts in practice and motivates educators to excel. And finally, it provides data that guides school leaders on additional development and support needs and helps them to create personalized pathways of support for teachers within their schools. And we see uh, as Dignitas impact both on learners and educators. At a learner level, we see impact uh, on learning outcomes. In this case of, of what I'm displaying here, we were able to use a pre and post lesson assessment to measure knowledge gain in the course of a lesson. We compared two groups of learners, ones who were in Dignitas supported schools and classrooms and others who were not. And what we saw was the learners in Dignitas supported classrooms had a 44% uh, knowledge gain in the course of a lesson, which was almost three times what the learners in non-Dignitas classrooms experienced. We also track using our competency rubrics and the coaching observations, we track progress and gains at, at educator level. This particular set of data here comes from a cohort of schools we partnered with pre-COVID, and we were tracking competencies around instruction, classroom management, preparation for learning and teacher leadership. And you can see within a relatively short period of time, this one was about 10 months, that there were significant gains um, across each of these competency sets. We typically see across any cohort of school partners about a 30% competency gain in the course of a one year partnership. Interestingly, in the most marginalized communities, we actually see the biggest gains. And that's often because sadly, the baseline um, is so low that the, they can make some huge steps towards progress in that first year. We've also used classroom observation tools to not just measure the gains in teacher practice, but how these gains in teacher practice correlate to gains in learner competency. So where, for example, we see teachers using an increasing number of uh, group activities, uh, where we see them improving their learner engagement, where we see them prioritizing classroom culture, we see learners uh, increase as a group, as a class, 
um, their indicators of increased self-efficacy, increased collaboration, and um, improved communication. Um, so we see this correlation between shifts in teacher practice and gains at the learner level. And this breaks down further and ties back to our competency rubric that breaks down these specific competencies that drive these three pillars that we spoke to earlier. So we see through partnering with schools and driving these school partnerships that strengthen school leadership teams, that there are significant gains to be had. And so that's really just to put in context the work that Dignitas does and where we were at as the pandemic hit. And I think it's important to, to note a few things uh, that apply specifically to our context as the pandemic hit. First, um, we watched COVID kind of unfold from a distance in, in other parts of the world. And I think like many of us at that point thought it, it's not really going to hit Kenya um, because it's still far off. And then of course it came much closer and, and we began to think that there really is a crisis approaching, yet very little preparedness on the ground and very little information. And it was in mid-March 2020, on the Friday, the government announced that the first case of COVID had been identified in Kenya. On the Sunday, just 48 hours later, the president decided and, and declared that all schools would be closed across the country and would not even open the following day. So teachers and school leadership trying to prepare themselves or their learners. For many children, they didn't even go back to school after the announcement of that first case because schools were closed immediately and indefinitely. That became 10 months of school closures because of uh, the many infrastructural challenges and capacity, human resource challenges that we face as a country. There was no official continuity of learning. So they basically called mid-March the end of term one and term two of the same academic year started in January 2021. The other important thing to note about our context is that children come to school for much more than just their education and learning. And for many children across the country, school is also their source of well-being and child protection. It's their source of so when schools closed, children were at children were facing a, a complexity and a multiplicity of risks. It wasn't just that their opportunity to continue to learn had uh, stopped. So we recognize that in response to this unfolding um, crisis, even though at that we didn't understand the extent to which that crisis would go, we recognized we needed to equip school leaders to lead their teams in new ways for new complexities, new scenarios, so that we could protect and very urgently protect the learning and well-being of every child in those partner schools. And that is indeed what we set out to do. We had three key aims. We wanted to engage our school leadership teams first to understand the barriers that school leaders face in supporting learning and well-being during school closures. We also wanted to explore the competencies, the mindsets, the tools that school leaders could use to support learning and well-being during school closures. And this is often with any of our programming, the question that we start with. What competencies, mindsets, and tools do school leaders need? And finally, we wanted to be able to respond to that by developing a set of training and coaching resources that would strengthen those exact competencies and mindsets in school leaders. And so we embarked on a study over a period of about six months initially, where we would gather the data that would help us to answer those three questions. Um, but that would also inform our response so that we could be sure our response was evidence driven um, and impactful for the learners we wanted to reach. We had to make this response very quickly and very urgently given the nature of school closures and, and what the children in our partner schools were facing. 
So we work primarily with about 60 school leaders um, and their teams within an urban setting. This was in the informal settlements of Nairobi, which are some of the most marginalized communities in our city. And then the second phase rolled out across 500 school leaders, mostly in rural locations, working in government schools. And so we established several things as part of our baseline study. First was that 70% of school leaders believed that they had a responsibility to support learner well-being during school closures, but 68%, almost the same number, recognized this as their biggest challenge. They didn't know how to support children beyond the walls of their school and their regular learning environment. Within the first month of school closures, only about half of children had had any form of correspondence from their schools. And not all of this was focused on learning. Much of it was forwarding of Ministry of Health uh, informational messages relating to COVID-19. Only 5%, so an extremely small number of school leaders have been able to maintain contact remotely with more than 75% of their learners whilst almost 40% of school leaders were in touch with less than a quarter of their learners. So a huge gap in that communication to learners, support for learners, and just guidance from the school and what the children should have been doing in terms of learning. In many places across the world, of course, parents um, played a, a prominent role in, in support given to children um, during school closures. But there are a couple of key things to understand also about parents and the support available to children at household level. We saw that just about a third of parents have secondary school as their highest level of education. 21% had only completed primary school and a very small number, 17% had experienced any form of tertiary education. So we did have a high number of parents who did not have great levels of literacy themselves and felt that was a barrier to how they could support their children at home. And when we asked parents to explicitly state the barriers to supporting learning at home, they, they, they sorry, documented these three. The biggest access to learning resources, 72%, 39% stated know-how as their biggest barrier, and 14% time. So again, a multitude of challenges that stood between um, support for learners um, and what was possible from the school communities. And so we used the baseline study findings and we dug into a series of focus group discussions, key informant interviews, and really reviewing the emerging literature, a lot of which was grey literature, but that was the nature of, of where we were. And that helped to inform a training and coaching framework in response to COVID for our school leaders. And it covered these eight themes, so looking at the role of school leaders in the crisis, looking at parents and how school leaders should be engaging parents, really pushing for many the scope of what they define their role as school leader, pushing them to think about well-being, dealing with trauma and anxiety, um, and really having them think holistically about their support for children and their families. Of course, we tapped into the, the need to also understand how to leverage resources for distance learning. Whilst there was very little coming from the government, um, there were radio and TV programs, there were some resources that civil society were sharing. So encouraging uh, school leaders to be able to utilize these with their learners and their households. And we plan several activities to ensure school leaders gain the competencies necessary around these eight uh, skills or these eight competencies. The first was that we delivered mini uh, professional development modules and toolkits via chatbot. We established online communities of pr practice via WhatsApp. We used coaching phone calls with group and individual. We also distributed student learning packs and um, initially covering literacy and numeracy and over time extended into project based learning activities that they could do at home. And where it was COVID safe, 
We equipped the school leaders for household visits as well, particularly to follow up on children who had no access to internet, TV, radio, um, and could only utilize the paper-based resources we were distributing to learn. And we were seeking to achieve four things. One, to ensure that children had access to quality care that ensured child safety and well-being during school closures. Two, that they would stay engaged in learning whilst at home. Third, that they would be uh, parents would be empowered to support learning at home. And fourth, that school leaders would be equipped to support households and ensure the well-being of children. Throughout program delivery, we were very intentional about being data informed, being responsive to the needs of the school communities and agile in our offering. It was an ever changing situation with a lot of fluidity around what to expect, both in how the pandemic unfolded and when schools may reopen, what that might look like. And so we had to be data informed to be able to consistently respond to the needs we saw amongst our learners. As a result, we developed a school digital training and coaching toolkit that includes virtual engagement rubrics to help us think differently about how we evaluate engagement and attendance of school leaders in training and coaching with virtual tools, these would be in-person workshops. We developed guiding principles for blended professional development, our team worked hard on new strategies that would help to build trust, build community, build digital literacy, all in low-tech communities. And finally, we partnered with Education Above All to leverage their internet-free bank of project-based learning resources. You can see on screen here a couple of um, screenshots of what we used as our digital training and coaching toolkits. On the right, you can see a screenshot screenshot of what's up something i'm sure many of us are familiar with that's where we ran our communities of practice the two screenshots in the middle are from our chatbot which delivered as i say the mini professional development modules with a short animation a digital toolkit and some reflection prompts and coaching support to help school leaders implement new strategies and school leaders themselves over time requested Zoom sessions where they could hold uh, in-person like <laughs> communities of practice and um, where they could see new concepts modeled um, and build out their practice themselves. What we saw over the course of the first four months was that 98% of school leaders said they gained new competencies and felt better equipped as a result of the training, coaching, and communities of practice. Within the same four months, we saw 99% of the households that were being supported had benefited from that support. One of the benefits they reported was reduced anxiety, both amongst parents and children. Another was that we saw households adopting daily routines that would support and promote learning, up from 56% at baseline to 94% at that midline point, and 97% of parents were now able, they felt, to support learning at home. Finally, we saw by analyzing the student learning packs, which as I say, initially focused on literacy and numeracy, we saw that there were steady scores in literacy and numeracy throughout the period of school closures, which spoke to an indication that we were able to stem some of the learning losses that we've seen really quite extensively now documented across uh, groups of children around the globe. The second phase of our support for school leaders in COVID focused on school reopening and recovery and essentially followed the same pattern of first, understanding uh, what the, the needs were amongst our community of school partners, understanding the mindsets and competencies that school leaders needed to adequately respond for this particular challenge, and then mapping that out in a training and coaching framework that would ensure school leaders got the support that they needed. You can see on the screen the eight topics that we dug into there, much of it related to the content we had also supported with during phase one, but now again digging into the support learners and teachers needed uh, to plug back into school. And um, there were huge challenges, both resource-wise, 
um, and support from, from the government was lacking. Um, a lot of the support at a school level was focused on the number of desks, were they able to social distance, the number of masks, um, the availability of water in schools, and very little uh, support around um, catch-up learning, around psychosocial support for teachers and learners, and some of the broader needs we saw that could actually have um, a really long-term um, impact, if not attended to. So we delivered support to the school leaders with the same digital training and coaching toolkits. Um, we still weren't able to visit schools at this point due to COVID restrictions. But we saw throughout this program delivery again, school leaders and teachers report that the training and coaching helped them to feel adequately able to deliver uh, support for remedial learning and help their learners catch up where they had dropped behind. We saw them able to provide psychosocial support that they said they wouldn't have been able to otherwise. And finally, we saw them able to re-engage learners at risk of dropout, which for our region and our context was a huge concern. Children who had since been engaged in labor, harmful cultural practices such as FGM and even child marriages and early pregnancies. And so we equipped teachers and school leaders to re-engage those learners and bring them back to school. So we saw this urgency around the pandemic and, and the conversations that that opened up enable us to build a training and coaching curriculum that focused on taking school leadership out of the classroom and into the community. We had to embrace parents as key stakeholders to a greater extent than we've ever done before. We had to equip and leverage educator agility to be able to reach every learner because every household situation was a little bit different from the next. And we had to equip them to be community-based leaders of learning. And from that, we learned several lessons. And this is where I'll conclude today. The first lesson was that leadership capability and support was a key determinant of one's agility, responsiveness, responsiveness, and their ability to sustain the learning and well-being of children in a crisis. We also saw that solutions that ignore inequalities only leave more children behind and are detrimental to overall progress. It's really important to think about each of the children in their household situations and the barriers that they may face to engage in things that would keep them safe and learning. And so we had to consider those inequalities even more than we typically do. Thirdly, there's a growing need to give attention to socio-emotional learning. In Kenya, even now we see this, we have a huge amount of school unrest currently with multiple school fires said to be set by learners on a daily basis in the last week or so. There's a huge amount of pressure on learners. Our academic calendar has been adjusted to try and catch up from COVID. There are implications even now with schools having been open since January on the, the failure to support socio-emotional needs of both teachers and learners. And we must give this our attention. And finally, to ensure no child is left behind, we need to make sure no parent is left behind. And that means considering the parent with little to no literacy, considering the parent who doesn't have a radio, a TV, a smartphone, considering the parent who's already on the poverty line uh, before a crisis like COVID. And so we must consider how we strategically engage parents to support their children's learning at school or at home. These four lessons we believe are impactful and important beyond COVID, beyond the pandemic, and particularly important as we consider ongoing shocks to the education system and potential future shocks. Thank you so much to, for listening today and walking through this journey with us of our learning in response to COVID and all that unfolded 
um, as, as we face the pandemic um, here in Kenya. I believe there are lessons here that go beyond our context and beyond Kenya, and I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to share with you.